this is based on a book that I have over in the bookstore that, that uh, took um, Bob Leonard. Hey, Bob. Bob's out in, in, um, in uh, Portland. He had a leg injury, so he couldn't be here to do this with me. Um, but we spent about nine months writing this book, which is about four months longer than I thought it would take, because once we got into it and we realized the importance of the facts, we really had to make the facts right. In fact, there's a chapter in here called Technology that took us a month just to write that one. Anyway, so the concept is we're moving to a finite Earth economy. And this is a quote that has driven me uh, relative to climate change since I read it in 1970, right around the first Earth Day from Buckminster Fuller. In several decades, humanity will be at a fork in the road, utopia or oblivion, either utopia of abundance or an oblivion of destruction. And I take that to mean that the path of destruction is purely climate change. Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energies not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So Greta Thunberg and everybody who's demonstrating the Sunrise Movement and everything else is doing the right thing, but we're not fighting against anything anymore. We have to build the new. And, and that, 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 was, that is really where we are. So all this continuation about the fossil fuel companies are bad, we all know that. We, you know, we need not to fight, we need to create. So fight or flight, the reason I wrote this book is that climate change is now. There's nothing genetically in humans that says, oh, you know, in several decades, we're gonna have a real big problem. Well, wait till I get there. And that's what you've been hearing about this morning. So climate change is now. Anybody who reads a newspaper or looks at TV, it's every single day. So the 50 years, and I say 50 years because it's the first Earth Day, um, and the 50th anniversary is in April, um, nothing has happened, slow incrementalism. So humans are reactive. So now we're in a reactive stage. So it's fight or flight time. And the fight or flight time, to me, was the reason to write the book because of the fact that, 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 that we're all used to this. Saber-toothed tiger, fight or flight. So it's genetically ingrained in us. So global warming, save the planet. I talked about that. It's so anthropomorphic, it, it is anthropocentric, it's horrible. We're not saving the planet. The planet's just fine. The planet's just reacting to how we're messing it up. We're the most invasive species of, of all time. And so we have to save ourselves from ourselves. And our economic construct and how we power it is the primary cause of global warming. So we live in, in AGW, anthropogenic global warming. We are the cause. We have to be the solution. So we have to change our economic systems. There's no other way that I can figure out but to change our economic systems, because economy has been the driver. I'll be speaking at the Economics Club uh, sometime later on this, right? Um, so crew consciousness. There are no passengers in spaceship Earth. We are all crew. The concept of crew consciousness is, um, I'll ask the Clements, how much do you pay a month on electricity in your house, roughly? About 140. 140, OK. So and how much electricity are you paying for? You don't know. I mean, how many, how many kilowatt hours? I have no idea. You have no idea, right? So for example, non-crew consciousness is coming to the monthly paying of the electric bill and saying, oh, it's about $140. I'll pay it. If it's $175, oh, it was really hot. You'll, you'll go through some gymnastics, and then you'll pay the bill. So you've come to the monthly bill paying as a price-oriented consumer. Crew consciousness is the fact that the average American, I use the average American uh, electric bill, is $100 a month, which is 1,000 kilowatt hours. So what Tim and I came up with when we started the Spaceship Earth was the 2% solution. So 1,000 kilowatt hours, if you're a crew member, you take it down to 980, and then the 1,000 is constant, 960. After six months, you're down to 880 kilowatt hours. So you've saved money. But what you're doing is you're crewing because almost all of your electricity has come from fossil fuels. So we've been conditioned as a price consumer just to pay the bill instead of being crew consciousness, which is I'm going to manage the electricity that I consume. Just that's, you know, I have another video up there that, that we did. Um, I used to love cheeseburgers, you know, cheeseburgers, gourmet cheeseburgers, really good crispy fries twice a week. I'm pretty much 
um, non-meat now, but we did a, you know, just cut that down from eight a month to two a month. That's 75% reduction in my beef consumption. What if 15 million people did that at the same time? It would change everything, which is why we have to all be crew, right? So here are the three things. And this is the, this is what, this is the single most important fact because whenever you watch mainstream media or anybody, you know, that, 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 that anybody who's running for president of the United States right now doesn't know what they're talking about, about climate change, okay? The first thing we have to do is what we all know we have to do. We have to eliminate fossil fuels ASAP. And you've seen this morning that no matter how much we talk or this, they keep going up. They keep going up, right? So, but people say, oh, we need to get off of fossil fuels and everything's fine. But no, the second thing is we have to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. I'll show you a chart. The increase in the resident CO2, as, as Harold said, when CO2 goes up into the atmosphere, it stays up there for centuries and millennia. So we're adding more, and it just is, it is that. The time congruency between the warming of the planet and the increase in resident CO2 in the atmosphere is completely time congruent. It is warming because of what is already up there. And most people think, oh, we just need to get off of fossil fuels. No, we need to get off of fossil fuels, and we need to draw down all the carbon we've put up there. And the third thing is the crew consciousness, because we can't operate without acting as crew. There are no passengers and space shippers. We are all crew. So those three things. This is the same chart that Tim had, and I'm putting it up there because I love being a target for climate change deniers, okay? Oh, well, it's cyclical. Everything's cyclical. Yeah, until we came along, right? By the way, ever meet a climate change denier? Here's what you say. You say to them, sir, you believe in it? By the way, I'll go on the record. I've never met a climate change denier who wasn't an aging white male Republican, okay? <laughs> so, so the point is, 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 seriously, you know, it's like, sir, if you believe it, how are you infusing your actions with your belief? I believe in climate change. I drive a high mileage, high miles per gallon car. I recycle. I do this. What do you do? They can never answer. So they just want to be obstreperous. And I love calling them out in front of a lot of people. Anybody here want to take the challenge right now, right? <laughs> so, so seriously, just say, what do you do if you believe something? Because if you say you believe something and you don't bring your belief into your actions, you don't believe it. Sorry about that. Um, so it's rising. That's the point. You said this this morning. I can skip through this. This is the Earth Overshoot Day. I want to touch on it again because Tim really introduced me to this. Overshoot, the ideal Earth Overshoot Day is midnight, 1231. In other words, we've gone through the whole year without stressing the planet about its ability to, to regenerate what we've done. So we have 50 years. And, and, and it keeps going. I did, this is the inverse in Tim's chart. But just think about it. August 1st, or, no, it's actually, August, it's going to be like July 26th, July 27th this year. That means after that date, we are taking more from the planet than it can regenerate. And we've been doing this for 50 years. So we're in a huge deficit. This goes to the part of my presentation about consumption. This is the resident CO2. And if you look at it, the, the Earth started to warm measurably between 1970 and 1980, which is the same time. We went, you know, we went from, from 830 gigatons of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere in 1980 to 1,300 now. And that's what that upward thing is. So we, that's when the Earth has warmed. This is the average mean of the temperature. And you remember, you want to point out what Tim said, which is we, we've lived and evolved in a tight range. So people say, oh, it's only going up at one degree. No, it, it, if it goes beyond one degree, it's, there's no history for humans operating at this high level of, of, of heat. So we've long left the time of denial. We're now in the time of disconnection. That's why I did this exercise. Part of the problem is people who have been green for a long time have spent all their time arguing against deniers, arguments of fossil fuels. So, so busy to argue, and we're green and you're not. And part of the problem is this kind of self-righteousness of green people who have been fighting the fight song, but you still went out and bought new clothes, right? You still bought an SUV. 
So the point is, we're in disconnection with what's going on. So, I really believe this now. In the last four months, I've come around to this. The stark reality is that sometime in the next 20 to 30 years, there might probably be a tipping point, planetary tipping point, where the planet will start a massive warming process that will last for centuries. We cannot plan for 2050. We can't, we can't wait for 2050 because of this acceleration. In the year 2000, oh, by 2100, we have to get off of fossil fuels. By 2010, it was, we have to get off of fossil fuels by 2050. And I'm here to tell you, it has to be by 2030. We have to go from 70% fossil fuels to 30% fossil fuels globally. Finite Earth economy. So everybody in this room has grown up in a growth economy. Growth economies are linear, right? You, you, you produce, you manufacture, you distribute, you sell, you buy, you use, you discard, repeat. There's no circular. So, so there's nobody in this room that is measured by how happy you are, how smart you are, how well educated. It's just, you're, you're only measured by how much you consume. GDP is just basically about consumption. So it's all about me, right? The circular economy, reduce, reuse, recycle, starting in 1970, was mostly about me, but a little bit of us. I'll buy some recycled stuff, okay? The problem with that, and we did the first research, Bob and I did in the book, was 50 years, reduce, reuse, recycle, 1970, to now, it's only 9% of the global GDP. So circular economy is nice. There's still books being written. We need to be in a circular economy. Too late. It's too late. 50 years, it's only 9% of the global GDP. So we have to move to a finite Earth economy. You can't have unlimited growth on a finite planet. So that's conscious non-consumption. Conscious non-consumption. Does anybody not have enough clothes? Raise your hand if you don't have enough clothes, right? You don't have enough clothes. OK, well, so you're a fashion hound. You've got to buy more because you want fashion, right? There's no reason. There's no reason to buy a second car. I've never bought a new car in my life. Why? The minute you drive it off, of course, it's depreciated. But you've taken something out of the planet. If you buy something used, it's already been taken out of the planet. You're not going into this deficit anymore. So conscious non-consumption. So this is where I'm trying to get, make the point. Think of yourself. How green do you think you are? And how ready are you to consciously non-consume? That's our path. I always hear, well, what about China? What if we, where, what if we do it and they don't? This is the per capita consumption. If everybody lived like Americans in the world, we'd have to have five worlds to support us, because we have a higher consumption. China is at one Earth. So this happened because post-World War II, I was in the media, post-World War II, remember we were fighting the, 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 the Soviets. So we had to show that consumption, the American way of life was really better. Buy a car, get a second car, get a washing machine. And then, of course, we won. And by then, everybody else in the world, because we'd sold the concept of the American way of life so much, they said, we want what you want. And we're kind of going, well, now we've learned about you know, climate science. You can't have it. That's the social and the climate injustice I'll address. But I just want to put this up here. We have to lead because we created the problem. There's been more wealth created since 1900 than all the time before. All the pharaohs, all King Tut, all that stuff. More wealth has been created since 1900 than, than historical prior to that. And that's consumption, population. You're going to hear a great presentation that's going to end this this afternoon for a guy named Chris Tucker about how we need to get down to 3 billion people. I'll let him make that presentation. But we basically overpopulated the planet. So what can we do to reduce emissions? Look at this. OK? I ask people, what is the single greatest act you can take or not take for carbon emissions? Oh, get an EV? Bike? No, have a child. The average American puts up 16 tons of CO2, 16 tons, right, um, in the atmosphere every year. The average globally is four. 
And yet, if you have a child, you're putting up 52 tons because then it gets measured over your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. So by the time you're in your great-great-grandchildren, you're down to 2.5 tons. So not only is overpopulation part of the problem, we have a choice. As Tim's slide said, there are high school kids saying, I'm not going to die from old age, I'm going to die from, from, from uh, climate change. So we know that there's going to be killing going on for food and water and land if this goes on unabated. So why not plan for it, right? And, and Drawdown said it is number one and two, really, on how to get, um, how do you cut down population by educating women? Okay, quick thing, women, women only, women only. Raise your hand, women only, if you think that if women completely controlled all decisions about childbearing, there'd be fewer children. There you go, right? So it's, it's empower, part of climate change is empowering women completely because of this. I mean, there are, there are numerous millennial uh, couples I've met that have said, um, we're seriously thinking not having children because how, we be, how can we afford to bring a, a child into an overstressed planet? This is the problem. It's obviously the quote of all time from Machiavelli. This is the fundamental philosophical problem we have. We just have to start doing the new thing, forgetting the old thing. So there's only one path. Catastrophic. We need to move by equal by 2100. That was thrown out 10 years ago based on feedback from the planet. Risky, aiming for 2050. And the only best probable is moving to a finite Earth economy by 2030. Now, we're going to do that? I don't think so. When I was writing this book with Bob, two or three times we had a heart to heart, like, is it even worth it to write this book? Because things are so much worse than, the, than we even thought it possible. We said, no, we've got to lay it out. And my commitment to myself as a futurist is I've got to be right about the future, otherwise I have no value. So this presentation is the right path. And we wrote in the book exactly year by year how a country should do it, how, how, how to get it done. Whether anybody follows it or not, at least it's out there. I mean, that's what I'm doing, right? 2030, it has to be by 2030. When Tim and I said by 2030 and 2015, we were ridiculed. October 2018, the IPC said by 2030. Because of this feedback loop that everything is accelerating. By 2030, folks, with all due respect to, to, to the Sierra Club, I mean, they were getting people like Tom to sign up and saying, we're going to be 100% green by 2050. And my comment always is, it's real easy to pass a bill. You're going to be dead to have to deliver on, right? I mean, like 2050? I'll, I'll pass it in 2015? I mean, that's just green self-righteousness, for lack of a better phrase. So urgency, urgency, urgency. OK, so here's the way for climate justice. 80% of all the energy in the world is consumed by the top 20 GDPs. 80%. So if you take the top 20 GDPs, and have them move to a finite Earth economy, going from 70% fossil fuels down to 30% fossil fuels by 2030, the other 175 countries, the poor countries, don't have to do a thing. That's why the Paris Accord is a total failure. And any of these presidents, oh, I'm going to join the Paris Accord, it's already failed. Right? They wanted 1.5 by 2040. We're going to be at 1.5 by 2025. So it's, it's incumbent on the top 20 GDPs to take the lead. And nobody else will have to do anything. The developed countries won't have to do anything. And the problem is, is that not one of the 20 GDP, top 20 GDPs that signed the Paris has even remotely come close to their commitments. This is, this is kind of, this is the uh, image of, this is the percent that goes up into the world, right? China's putting up more now because there's more people. This is the last year. So, if you just take, the, if you just take um, again, the top, t let me, the top 10, this is an interesting thing. Um, notice at the, at the bottom how China's come up, but because the EU's been around the longest, they put up the most amount just because they, they're in the industrial age the longest. 
but this is where it's moving to the right, and all the others. So if just China, US, Euro, India, Russia, and Japan changed to a finite Earth economy, none of the rest of the world would have to. This is the disparity on, just think about it. You put up, 50, this is old, you put up six, each one of you, if an average American put up 16 tons of carbon every year. Did you know that you have a, a, a quarter pound hamburger in a restaurant? That's six pounds of CO2. You have a six ounce filet of fish? That's four pounds of CO2. You buy a t-shirt? That's two pounds of CO2 because we're disconnected. It's not just out of the tailpipes. But, but look at this. So you, you notice that the average of the world, I'm not sure if the pointer here, the average of the world is 4.35, and the developed countries is 9.02, and we are at uh, United States, Canada, we're, we're up at now 16. So keep that in mind. Four globally, 16 US. Greenhouse effects, we, you, we've seen this this morning, I'll leave it up for a minute. So transportation is such a small part of it. So urgency, absolutely. Sources of clean energy. Right now, this is the hierarchy of sources of clean energy in the global economy. Hydroelectric is number one. Nuclear is number two. Wind is number three. Solar is number four. Fusion and others, maybe, maybe not, are at the bottom. Okay, so if you look at this, so coal, oil, gas. I hate natural gas saying they're clean energy, right? So you take them out, look at, if you look at the 2018, look what happened to nuclear, because the nuclear fear went from 17% down to 10%. Hydro is at 16%. So hydro is number one, clean. Nuclear is two. Biomass is third. Excuse me, wind is third. Biomass is fourth. And solar is at 2%, right? So, so there's an illusion that wind and solar will get us there. It'll get us there maybe by 2050. We're going to have an energy conversation at the end of the day. Um, so technologies, additive manufacturing is a game changer. Not only will it allow us to land on Mars by the early 2030s and have a colony, but it will reduce the use of concrete, it will reduce the use of supply chain, because you will be able to, to I've, I've been, in, I've been in, a, uh, in a room that, man, you go in, you get the design of the car made, computer animated design, it's made out of graphite, you bring in the drivetrain and the tires, and you come back in three weeks and you pick up the car. And I grew up in Chicago where the stuff got sent to Gary to be made into steel, and then it got shipped to Detroit, got made into cars, and then the cars were shipped to dealerships all around the country. You know, instead, you just go into one place and no carbon, no transportation, no supply chain. So additive manufacturing is, going to, is a transformative technology. Automation, automation is always more efficient. Big data and data analysis. I always say we're in the third stage of human mapping. The first was to map the continents. The second was to map how to sail around them or cross them over. The third is big data, which is real time um, anthropology and sociology. So when the CEO says to me, I know what happened last month in my business, I say, what about last night? So we have data, we have sensors, we can deploy all around the world to be smarter about climate change. Blockchain, won't go into that too much, but blockchain is, is, has a transformative effect, assuming they assume solve the energy problem that it now has. But the, but the idea is that this will be a game changer for the internet and for financial transactions. Satellite imaging, right? We, we, we by, 20, by the end of 2021, there will be a satellite up there. So the nightly news is, today, the United States put up this many tons of carbon. We'll be able to measure it on a daily basis. We have that capability. Make it part of the nightly news, a, a, an emissions reporting. So the technology is going to be there to measure emissions, certainly globally by 2022. Sensors everywhere. So, so we, can, we can see all this ebb in the flow. That's, that's how we got alerted to the fact that the ice was melting faster than Harold was talking about, because there were sensors that were, that were like, what? The temperature shouldn't be this way. And sharing, all, sharing of technologies uh, across the board and opening it up. Remember, sustainability is a meaningless word unless you talk about it at the global level. So the only way to be global is to share. 
So carbon, drawdown, carbon capture, sequestration. One of the things about sequestration we wrote in our book, um, how do you take the bad guys and make them the good guys? So carbon sequestration is taking carbon and burying it deep under Earth. Well, who has the technology and the already paid for infrastructure to do that? Oil and gas companies. So why not take the oh, I'm, so why not take the oil and gas companies and create a carbon market so they will get paid to to sequester carbon. In other words, take the economy, turn it upside down to face carbon. Direct air capture. I'm going to move quickly through this, but but I want to get to this point. This is a great quote. Wasteful consumerism is a contemporary evil. We need to get back to economic, plain, simple, and useful. And the great singer-songwriter, think about the RE. If it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, resold, refinished, resold, resold, composite, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed. Okay? Simple. It's simple, right? What you have to think about is, are you ready to do it? We stand at a threshold. Key questions there are those posed by the intersection of design and life itself. We've ended, I've mentioned this at the panel. Um, wealth inequality, climate change, democracy, capitalism, it's all redesigned. Tim and I wrote this in our book. So agriculture, permaculture, lab beat, vertical gardens. We need to do all this. We know it. That's what Tim was saying. Now, we, we know, or was it you? Or, 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 yeah, we know how to do it, so why aren't we doing it? Well, the other guy's supposed to do it. EVs, auto autonomous. Autonomous automobiles. Since I've been a futurist who's a green person, I've always sat on these conversations about what's 21st century green infrastructure for transportation. And it's just flipped. We have the infrastructure for 21st century transportation in the United States. It's called the interstate highway system, but with half the number of cars, because they'll all be autonomous. So we've looked at the infrastructure rather than the mode, the individual mode. So autonomous vehicles, the average American uses their car 4% of the time. If you would ask a businessman, would you make your second biggest capital investment to something you use only 4% of the time? Of course you wouldn't. We've all consumed that we have to have cars. Right? The, green, the, the greenest per, car, per capita city in the United States is what? Anybody, quickly. No, New York. They don't have cars. Electric air travel. By the way, by 2022, there's somebody who's flying electric planes now. They're, they're float planes, seaplanes, from Vancouver to Vancouver Island to Seattle. It's got a 200-mile range. It's supposed to be a 500 mile range by 2022, 2023, which is 60% of all the flights in the United States of America. The question is, is the, can the airline industry retrofit in enough time? I mean, will Boeing still be in business? <laughs> We're not gonna be able to operate our space. I'll just let you read these. The key thing is the middle one. I use that every single presentation. The illiterate of the 21st century, Toffler said this about education, not be to learn those who read, cannot read or write, those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The key verb for the 2020s is relearning. We have to relearn everything. So what's this quick, a map of? Trick question, obviously. What's this a map of? Somebody's giving me the answer. The world. the world, right, no it's not. This is a map of the world. That's a map of nation states. Until we get out of nation stateness, we can't solve a global problem. Right, think of it that way, right. Strategic retreat, or strategic retreat. Between now and 2030, it's estimated a low of 30 to a high of 100 million people, climate refugees, 500 million by 2050. So these are the historical, you add them all up. These are the greatest historical, we documented historical migrations in human history. You add them all up and you get to the mid-range of what's gonna happen between now and 2030. Where are the people, where are the four million people in Miami gonna live in 2040? Are we planning for that? So you've seen this. I'm, I'm all the way in the catastrophic. Anybody who's not looking at catastrophic, and that's, that's the low range of catastrophic. Now, you heard Harold, so move past that. So these are the countries, 
and the amount of population exposed. It's a staggering number. Most of it's Asia and South Asia. So you saw that population. This is an interesting chart to the population thing. You always see the thing on the right. You don't see the thing on the left. They're completely overlapped. More carbon, more people, more carbon. More people, more carbon. Co consume, consume, consume. So what do we do? Nation states, tax code based on CO2, not income. Four, remember, four, four uh, tons average around the world, and we're at 16. So let's start taxing at ton five. $100 for ton five, $200 for ton. So by the time you get to 16, the average, we did the quick math, you're going to generate more revenue to the United States Treasury by taxing carbon emissions. And it's more egalitarian. If you're rich, you have multiple homes, you have multiple cars, you may have a jet. You're going to pay a lot more. So what's that going to do if you have a tax code based on emissions? It's going to change subsidy. We, we, we need to change, but the state of the carbon emissions for a moment, the, the carbon emissions is such that, that, that um, time's up. OK, so I'll go through this real quickly. I believe in national service. We need a conservation crew, a cleanup crew, a carbon offset crew, an energy efficiency crew. You know, c conserve what we got, clean up what we've messed up, um, develop carbon offsets, and, and, and retrofit all the installed base of buildings. So states and provinces lead by example. Transportation, you heard it up here, make it all EVs. Highway line usage. By 2025, the left lane is for EVs with two people in it. The next left lane by 2025 is for EVs, and the right lane is ICE, internal combustion engine cars, right? And let them know. Taxes, trees, you just part of your, it, it, you know, part of your taxes will go to trees and agriculture. That's the state. The cities is pretty easy. It's zoning, transportation, support neighborhoods, taxes, and deductions. In other words, if we go to a carbon-based tax system, everybody wants to reduce their taxes, so they'll go buy an EV, or they'll invest in a carbon offset, or they'll invest in a, 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 an atmospheric carbon um, cleansing technology. So we'll flip it if we just change the taxes, right? Um, Tom Barwin said, uh, Surgeon General, Surgeon General report, smoking will kill you, 1964. Nothing happened until advertising on television went off in 1971, and we started to tax it. Seat belts, we all knew seat belts would lower, would lower fatalities, but the problem was it wasn't until it was the law that it happened. So it's just a matter of making it all about a carbon tax. If we want to stop carbon, we tax it. You want to stop cigarettes, you tax it. So urgency, urgency, urgency. I love this bottom quote. How did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> We're into suddenly. So summary. And that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs>